Does anyone look at a wall and go like, dang, that's really something, huh? Uh, anybody? Uh, do you like John Waters? He did make a great point about movies when he said, There's no such thing as a bad movie. If you go to a movie watching detail only, if you really hate the movie, just look at the lamps in it and pretend the movie is about lamps. And then never is it boring. It's always exciting and it's always surprising. And just as he talks about lamps, it's the same for the walls that surround the characters. And it can be a brilliant movie or not, it doesn't matter. You can focus on a wall because it makes a statement by its mere placement in the frame. I mean, if you look behind me, this fancy moving wall is really something, huh? It conjures an emotion, right? Well, what about this? Or this? Or this? Maybe its appeal goes much deeper than its surface. Because all these pictures and animations of walls I've shown you were all curated, created, or influential to this presentation. So, it's not just a wall, it's about the emotions it conjures or the ideas it frames. And if these walls could talk, this is how they'd speak to us. So come check this out with me on this episode of Movies from the Deep. Life Force, or as it's known by its much, much better title, Space Vampires, is an impressively weird big-budget film directed by Toby Hooper, known for Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist. It was funded by Canon Studios, which produced many, many low-budget sleazy action films, but this nutso-crazy monstrosity was an exception. A big-budget sci-fi film with a big director, a big production designer, loads of talent, and full to the brim with lots of stuff. It has naked space vampires, space zombies, military bombast, an unhealthy fear of women and gay people. Also, Patrick Stewart. It's so bonkers it can't hold itself together and I love it. Where's your body? <laughs> Let me go! Let me go! But I'm going to focus on one specific scene in the movie, the intro, where the astronauts venture into a giant space room. That's this movie, folks. That's Life Force, based on a novel called Space Vampires. Yes, Looks like some sort of giant artery, organic. I almost have the feeling I've been here before. So in the space room, they see a bunch of dead, dusty pterodactyls or whatever. While it has this fleshy, womb-like quality at first, it's got this unnatural, almost puzzling thing going for it. Like a quality that looks cultivated, organized. Not like flesh, but almost like an insane zen garden. I don't know. But it transitions to a room of technological-looking, crystalline things, with three people presented in stasis in the middle. So that's quite a visual difference. Anyway, these are the space vampires, and they can take the shape of other life forms. So this transition from flesh, technology, and dead things in this cavernous space womb is meant to keep us off guard, because it almost resembles something we know. But really, the space vampires are almost undefinable. More like the Thing than Dracula. And honestly, I don't have much else to say other than, dang, just take another look. Wow. Stalker is an anomaly of a movie, with a contentious production fraught with difficulty and a lethal effect on the lives of the cast and crew, it stands as a monumentally troubled beauty of a film. It was directed by Andrei Tarkovsky and based on the novel Roadside Picnic by Boris and Arkady Strugatsy. The film, though, is a methodical and slow-moving mystery, a beautiful, elegant, serene, and deeply meditative view on desire. But I would say, more so than its message, its walls, its forest, and its decay are the stoic statements that have most impressed themselves into my psyche. The visual character of the zone is distinct and emotive, but rustic and deceptively still. So these walls, these arches, and, sorry, those riverbeds capture drama long past and ever changing. You see, the zone is a place where a stalker must throw stones to make sure the path is clear, or else something bad will happen. Their destination is literally yards in front of them, and yet they have to take a long, winding route, and they end up pontificating and debating about their own experiences.
Учить меня смыслу жизни. И мыслить заодно. Бесполезно. However, despite their personal journey, their inner discovery is tied to the space it inhabits. Not two or multiple separate parts of a whole, but one whole thing. One whole connected idea. So the detail that can be seen on the tiles, the walls, are very much a part of the personal journey of the characters, and by extension the viewer. Yet the viewer is not seeing everything the characters are, and neither are the characters seeing everything the viewer does. Yet does this invalidate any one person's or character's experience through this? Well, the thing is, these characters are not just led by the stalker, but we are led by all three of them through this zone, and possibly to our own enlightenment. Now here's a war movie. Paisan is an anthology film directed by Roberto Rossellini about Italy during World War II. It spans the whole country, moving from Naples to a liberated Rome to a secluded Sicilian ruin and more. And it's one of the poster films for the Italian neorealist movement that sprung out of World War II. Italian neorealism was known for its use of non-professional actors, real locations, and almost documentary-like portrayals of drama compared to its studio-centric predecessors. While there is contention about just how much of a neorealist film this or Rossellini's films generally are, it is at its core a potent dramatic work with an extraordinary view of war-torn Italy. Specifically, I'm going to focus on the second segment, taking place largely among the crumbled facades of the ally-occupied port of Naples. It begins with a drunk military policeman who's been partying hard, and he joins company with a poor boy in the streets. The MP calls him Paisan, and the boy calls him Joe. As they stumble around, we see the freshly bombed Naples. This was released in 1946, after all. And as Paisan pesters Joe, they sit atop a pile of rubble that surely used to be a wall. Joe amuses himself in the boy's presence, singing and making up stories. Oh, Paisan gives him a useless key to his ruined house, but Joe is reminded of his home. My home is an old shack with ten cans for doors. I don't need that key. I don't want to play no more, Paisan. And as much as he wants to go back, it's small consolation. However, Paisan steals Joe's shoes, and he ends up finding him again and making him fork them over. But as he discovers the squalor the boy lives in, he drops the shoes and runs away. Dove, mom and papa? Mom and papa, are here. They're both, both, both. They're both, both, both. As if his talking about his separate and very American fantasies on the crumbled walls of someone else's home actually catches up to him. It doesn't shoot down Joe's takes, after all. It acknowledges his lower status in America, but it does place them in context. And more importantly, it does it honestly. Have you all heard of Possession? It's an emotionally charged, surrealistic horror film directed by Andrzej Zulowski, starring Isabella Johnny and Sam Neill. Yes, that very pre-Jurassic Park Sam Neill. And it takes place technically in 1980s West Berlin, but more narratively in the minds of the characters. It's a horror film about divorce, and it's absolutely brutally intense. The emotions of the characters are on full display here. Like really, if you've ever done acting exercises where you just embody an emotion and try to find it as honestly as possible, this film uses something like that for its narrative. And it is beautiful, striking, and scary. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
But this is about walls, right? I admit I keep getting sidetracked. Well, there are not one, not two, but three kinds of walls here. Clean walls, dirty walls, and Berlin walls. Whoa. But I'll just be covering the former two. The walls embody the character's desire. Every wall inside is clean. It's freaking spotless. For this film, it is arranged as a wish for messy lives, for an aspirational quality that is definitely not there. It begins with a Johnny and Neil awkwardly together, saying how this isn't working. It's just natural feelings change. But without you, I wouldn't feel anything at all. What do you feel now? And it goes absolutely off the wall. Not sorry. The first really, truly telling moment is when their child, Bob, has fudged everything up around them. Chocolate's on him and stuff is everywhere and dang. It contrasts so vividly to the clean wall. At that point, the seams are already bursting, but now it has reached their offspring. But these walls, instead of representing that aspirational quality, become opaque cages, stifling and utterly difficult to breathe in. I mean, just check out Ajani's legendary performance when in the relatively clean metro station. The animal in her rips out, the walls become stained with milk, and aspirations have been obliterated. Here's the 2005 Korean film directed by Park Chan-wook. You're probably familiar with 2003's Old Boy or 2016's The Handmaiden. But this is Lady Vengeance, the final chapter in the Vengeance trilogy. It stars Young Ai Lee, who is known primarily for her role in Dai Jang Guma, a hugely successful Korean TV show about a woman in the 15th century who is an outstanding royal cook and eventually changes her role by combining her studies with medicine to her cooking. It's great. I love it. Gum Ja, though, in Lady Vengeance, is actually a baker. And I have a feeling that was intentional because it's exactly the opposite of the clean TV aesthetic. It's a dark and grimy movie. However, it has an ornate quality, like the colors in the palette were carefully chosen to evoke just enough wild animal craziness, but with a sense of organized, patterned logic, in service of enacting vengeance to a man who is the height of evil, a child murderer. And the walls that surround Gumjar are always giving her away, giving us a visual indication as to the method, the process of her thoughts. It is never more evident than in her bedroom, with the weird, wavy, chaotic red walls surrounding her person. They're fiery and intense, but even the negative space is a dark red. But the biggest giveaway are the patterns. It feels like organized rage, but it has the shape of liquid, so it flows and adjusts. But it also has the colors of fire. It supports her character as angry, calculated, but adaptable. It contrasts with the action scene where the bricks behind visually frame her in a way that makes her look out of her element, like she's nearly sucked into darkness. It emphasizes her desperation as she moves herself to murder a man who has captured her only child. And when she is with her child, she asks, Why'd you dump me? against a polka dot pillow. And as Gumja is set against the intense red, she tries to make her not ask that question. I mean, why? Again, it contrasts beautifully, and while a pillow isn't a wall, it is framed like one, and these two clash in a rather poetic harmony. It's quite touching, because there's a desire to be present in the moment. So we've seen striking walls, blank walls, broken walls, ever-changing walls, and plain old bombastic homophobic walls. Questions later. If the camera frame is a window, then a wall is the enclosure to understanding the feelings, the setting, the plot, and even the heightened reality of cinema. And isn't cinema about life when we get down to it? So if walls are an integral part of the narrative of cinema, aren't walls just about life, right? But, uh, okay, before you unsubscribe, I want to let you know I have a point. The thing is, walls and films complement, contrast, or emphasize the ideas of a narrative. They aren't the narrative itself. 
None of it works in a vacuum. You saw how I tried to just talk about walls for the last 10 minutes or whatever. You can't separate them from the narrative. Heck, you can't ignore the impact of the walls around you right now in relation to yourself. Because don't you feel different when you walk outside or even into another room? Because that is ultimately about your feelings in that point in time. And because it's about those feelings, there is power in awareness. So when you take the John Waters example and just appreciate a lamp in the context of a movie or mine and look at the walls, you can find presence and calm with the experience of the moment. 